uh, by Professor Tom Wells on the Declaration uh, of Independence. Uh, Professor Wells earned his bachelor's degree in history, essentially, and minored in secondary education from Howard Payne University, a master's of arts in history and English, I'm sorry, I let, let the cat out of the bag, uh, from Tarleton State University, and he also took quite a number of courses as well uh, at, at TCU. Uh, he taught at uh, Granbury High School for 11 years before we were able to steal him away in 1993. He actually taught part-time starting in 1978 here, and then he became full-time instructor in 1993. You, can, you guys can do the math on that. Um, besides being a former chair of the department, uh, teaching for however long, doing all sorts of committee work and all sorts of things that oftentimes people don't recognize uh, that he did and has done over the years. Uh, he was also he, been a part-time uh, professional photographer, a composer, and he likes to point out that when he was at TCU, is this correct? Uh, he was taught by a history professor who later on uh, was or became? Already was? He wasn't already. Uh, he became, he was knighted by uh, Queen Elizabeth. So there you go. So how many of you people know that? All right, so with that, uh, welcome Professor Tom Wells. Thank you. The uh, person at TCU, they, somebody paid him $25,000, which is quite a bit of money in 1974, to teach two classes at TCU. I was in both of them. J.H. Plum, leading expert on 18th century England, and he was not only later became Sir John Plum. He was involved, we didn't know this at the time, neither did anybody else. He was among the brainiacs in Bletchley Park who unlocked the Enigma machine during World War II. Wow. So he told us he would remember us for 20 years and then forget us. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have that kind of control myself. Okay, we're going to be talking about the Declaration of Independence. And uh, people sometimes tend to get that confused with the Constitution. They're both kind of back there side by side. And uh, so we'll try to, try to draw a distinction. They're 11 years apart. I remember uh, on, a, on a Constitution Day in 1987, it had been 200 years, uh, my students and I went down to the Hood County Courthouse where a state district judge made this little talk about the Constitutional Convention, and he referred to the colonists. They hadn't been colonists in 11 years. So uh, uh, we'll, we'll try to make sure that's all clear. The uh, Declaration of Independence is not a legally binding document. It's not enforceable. It's a statement of principles. It might be called a, maybe a manifesto. So we're going to, uh, first of all, put this in a historical context. What we're, when I say we, I'm talking about the colonial population. I probably did have ancestors among them, but either way, uh, how we were before all the trouble started. And then um, ideas about government, ideas about the royal government, our identity, and then um, the events that got people thinking about about independence. And it was a hard thing. <coughs> to be up front. This was a hard thing for people because their 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 devotion to to the empire and to being being British that was very deep and emotional. It was just hard to, for people to get past that. And once they're out of it, it's quite exciting. And then uh, the immediate politics leading to the declaration or the declaring. And then uh, uh, unpack the document itself. Because that's, in a way, the most important part of it. It's a statement of the most basic principles, philosophical principles of our whole way of, uh, way of government. And it's had, a, it's had a global impact. Okay, it's been less than two and a half centuries ago. We then became the world's first colonial population to win independence and make good on our own. And for over a hundred years, the United States would be the hero and role model of colonial revolutionaries around the world and the ideals, the philosophical ideas embodied in the Declaration of Independence uh, were adopted so, so widely that, for, well just, when we declared independence, monarchy in some form or other had been the default form of government for pretty much the entire human race for around 3,000 years. Today, barely two centuries later, monarchy is an endangered species. There are very few left. And even those are, are uh, figureheads. They're traditional, ceremonial, and even dictatorships pay lip service to ideas we basically put in play by calling themselves people's republics. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's where we're going here. 
so the, the background, um, when we were colonists for a long period of time, we were, uh, we're satisfied. We're law-abiding. Uh, we've got a very good deal here. We did not identify as American. There's no American identity. It's an adjective, not a noun. Somebody stands up and says, well, I'm an American. What? You were English, regardless of your ethnic background. Uh, and that, was, that became a very deeply felt attachment. And you also identify with your own colony. So the idea of an American identity for individuals comes along quite a bit later. Um, part of the satisfaction was the fact that the British government really wasn't messing with us. They're over there, we're over here. The only thing about the colonies they cared about at all was commerce and trade. This was a businessman's empire. It's, um, it's a commercial empire. It's not a territorial empire. It was not conquered by armies. It was not a government project. None of the colonies started out as government projects. They were set up by businessmen hoping to earn a profit, religious refugees seeking shelter, um, visionaries hoping to start the world over again. None of them were government projects. So the only thing that Britain cared about was trade, and that's the only thing they ever tried to regulate. Uh, they, they don't have a, anything like a comprehensive colonial policy other than an odd amalgam amalgamation of trade laws. Uh, some of them were beneficial, some of them not, some are just curious, some are stupid, but that's it. They're called the navigation laws. That's the closest they can to having an imperial policy. So the colonies uh, begin, they grow, they thrive, they prosper against the background of almost complete absence of regulation or oversight. This goes on for quite a while. I should mention the colonial period is not a hop, skip, and a jump. If you date from the beginning of the first colony <coughs> in Virginia in 1607 to the Declaration of Independence, you're looking at 169 years. So 12 of the 13 colonies are set up over a period of about 75 years, uh, Pennsylvania being the next to last in the early 1680s. Um, Delaware was split off of that. And then 50 more years after that, Florida, Florida comes in. Not Florida, I'm sorry, Georgia. So it, they've been there for a while, so no comprehensive imperial policy. In the 18th century, they sort of had an unofficial policy of not having a policy. It was referred to as salutary neglect. The word salutary means beneficial or helpful. This was uh, uh, the brainchild of the first ever prime minister, Sir Robert Walpole, who seems to have taken the view that yes, if the English Parliament, that's their legislative body basically, if they want to micromanage the, the colonies, they have every right to do so, but why would you do that? The English are getting rich, the Americans are getting rich, the Americans are happy, the English are happy. It's working, it ain't broke. No reason to fix it. To try to micromanage, it would take administrators, it would take troops, it would cost money, we'd have to raise taxes, and um, the taxpayers would not take that well and would kick our bohannies out of office the next chance they get. So they just left us alone. Salutary neglect. Got a problem? We get to solve it. So that we come to see that as our birthright as Englishmen. Okay. Um, so we could set our own taxes. We could make our own laws. We had protected access to the markets of the British Empire. Um, and that, uh, that worked out extremely well. If we needed it, which was occasionally, we would have the protection of the British Army and the British Navy. Okay. Were there issues that people could grumble about? Well, yeah, we're Americans. We grumble, don't we? You're not an American if you don't have things to complain about. So it's not all perfect, but they had less to grumble about than we do. Uh, one thing I might mention was that we're part of a larger world. We're part of a British Empire, and the French are present up in the St. Lawrence River Valley, what's now southeastern Canada. And we went through a long period of time before, during, and after our revolution, hundred over a century and a quarter, from 1689 to 1815, 126 years, Britain and France were at war with each other about half of the time. And there are three wars you've probably never heard of where Americans, we would call them, colonists, basically were at war. In wars they wouldn't have heard about.
had they not been for Lee and Ryan. You ever heard of uh, King William's War? 1689 to 1697, hardly over when you get Queen Anne's War, 1702 to 1713. And then uh, King George's War, 1740 to 48. Uh, in each of those wars, colonial populations on the northern frontier were punished more severely than any Americans have ever suffered in any war we've ever fought. The closest thing would be certain aspects during the Revolutionary War and the Civil War. Meanwhile, the imperial military forces, colonial soldiers com commanded by amateur colonial officers, uh, carried out large-scale and successful missions uh, against French strong points at the mouth of the uh, St. Lawrence River, and every time we would capture something, there'd be a peace treaty, and the British would give it back. Here we are, we think we're pulling our weight, we're so proud. Celebrations in all the colonies prefiguring American nationalism by more than a century, they give it back. People don't forget that kind of thing. So with that and other things, it's not 100% perfect. Okay. But bottom line, we're arguably the most loyal and law-abiding colonial population in the history of the world. Assumption, assumptions about government. Not they, some people don't really think really about it very much. Not many people did. They don't until uh, threats seem to arise. But uh, there's a, a very deeply held belief that as we are Englishmen, our rights are best protected in England's ancient constitution, and I'm going to give it air quotes. <laughs> Their constitution is not like ours. It's not a distinct <coughs> document that uh, supposedly is the law that even the government must obey. We would do well to return to that ourselves. They're basically, they've been making it up for themselves as they went along ever since about 800 years ago. It's, a, it's an accumulation of edicts and traditions that evolve, but still people believed in it, and um, uh, it included limitations on the power a king could exercise. Uh, I don't have time to go into a bunch of uh, English history, but they had a long struggle of finding a way to effectively limit the power of monarchs. And we start with the, uh, the Magna Carta in 1215, and on, on down through the, uh, the emergence of the institution of uh, Parliament starts out at the Magnum Concilium, the King's Advisors, and in the mid 13th century, King Edward I. If you saw the movie Braveheart, he was the villain. He also gives us representative government. He could decide to be a good idea to bring in middle class representatives. That uh, evolves into the House of Commons, which alone had the authority to grant the king the authority to collect taxes. And some king gets painted in the corner, I gotta have money, calls the parliament into session, well, your majesty, we need this, and they'd have their shopping list. So the reason why the power of the English monarchy remains today complete, undiminished, and unimpaired is that the House of Commons exercises it in the name of the king. That's been the case for over 300 years now. It's official. The king does not, or queen does not, personally exercise the power. Uh, and they can do anything they want to. All right. Um, uh, things that influenced political thought, things in the background that people knew about. Uh, most of the colonies were set up during the 17th century. It's a very turbulent century in English history where they dealt with, uh, with kings whose use of power seemed unacceptable. Uh, king Charles I blundered into a civil war. The king's forces versus the parliamentary forces. Other than that, you can't analyze who was what. But conveniently for him, he lost and ended up getting his head chopped off. The last English king to die by violence. They, they convicted him treason. That's slippery. Treason was acting against the interest of the king. <laughs> had to prove to the court that he's his own worst enemy, but he was. And so he lost his head and got carried away. And then they abolished the monarchy for 11 years and then brought it back. Later in the century, you have King James II, who for very complex reasons becomes uh, unacceptably uh, unpopular. He got fired. He got fired. <laughs> they, uh, I, too many stories to tell. Uh, the Parliament declared that by leaving English soil with foreign troops on English soil, then commanded by his son-in-law, who brought an army over from, from the Netherlands, he had abdicated his throne. So they, they conferred the monarchy on his daughter and son-in-law. They never had any kids, probably a good thing, they were first cousins. 
<laughs> King William the Third and Mary the Second, William and Mary. Uh, they died without issue, and then uh, that she was James's older daughter. His younger daughter became Queen Anne, and the Parliament decided they passed a law banning any uh, any descendant of James the Second from ever being a monarch. So who's next? He had to find this old woman over in Germany who had a claim, and her son became King George the First. In 1714, George I didn't speak English. He's out of the way. He spends most of his time in Germany. So does his son, George II. Neither one of those first two Georges paid any attention to government, leaving the English to their own devices. The institution of the prime minister begins to evolve. Absentee kings. All right. So the, the fact that, that kings have been deposed when they get uh, out of line. That's back there. Okay, um, and in the early 1690s, as part of the deal where they became joint monarchs, William and Mary had to accept parliamentary supremacy that from then on, the parliament would exercise the full power of the monarch in the name of the monarch, and it's still that way. People who influenced political thought, I should tell you that um, uh, this mainly applies to literate people, and within that group, mainly lawyers. Because lawyers tended to be the ones who spot issues first and take the lead in dealing with them. There was an English uh, jurist, uh, very basically almost legendary reputation, Sir Edward Cook. Lived in the late 1500s, early 1600s. Uh, made some enemies. He's in and out of favor with the king. But every year he would publish a digest, a sort of summary of the rulings of the English common law courts. And uh, that became basic reading. Even people who didn't like Cook consulted his, uh, his uh, digest. He also was responsible for a commentary on another jurist known simply as Cook on Littleton. By the way, his name is spelled like Cook. You know, see Cook. And all the uh, aspiring lawyers had to read it. They all hated it. I saw the word impenetrable more than once. <laughs> He's bringing in some ideas that he urges English judges to reject actions of the king which, which are contradictory to the traditional constitution. Um, the idea, one of the, what might even sound familiar, a man's home is his castle. As long as a person is behaving himself, he should be as secure in his home, his property should be as secure as if he were a prince. So uh, these, these ideas plant the seeds of, of this sort of thing, along with planting the seeds of what we now call judicial review of uh, courts being in a position to determine the constitutionality of laws. Okay. Um, while I'm at it, educated people, to be educated was to be able to read Latin. That had once been the language of literacy, bridging all the lang language barriers of Europe. And what do you read when you're learning to read Latin? You read stuff written during the ancient Roman Republic. And there's certain values just oozing out of that. Of, of, uh, see, the Republic, a Republic was anything that didn't have a king. This before they became an empire. So the idea of service to the community, of government power being strictly for use for the public benefit, never for your own private benefit. One story that everybody knew about has a, a big influence. There was a, an ancient Roman named Cincinnatus. He's a good Roman. He's out plowing his field. They respected hard work. A runner came informing him that, that the enemy had invaded from the north. It's just when Rome was a city-state. And that the Senate had, uh, had uh, uh, given him what's called the Imperium. It's not an object. It was absolute power that a selected citizen would use to deal with the situation. So um, Cincinnati should be, I guess, in the Guinness Book. Maybe he is. He dropped the reins of his plow horse, strapped on his armor, rallied the militia, expelled the invaders, had returned the Imperium to the Senate, and was back plowing his field in two weeks. <laughs> so the idea that power was, political power was to be used for public benefit, not private aggrandizement, sinks its roots very deeply. There's almost a, an umbilical connection between the culture of uh, colonists who led the revolution and the values of the ancient Roman Republic. In fact, after the Revolutionary War, this, there was an organization of uh, former Revolutionary War officers calling themselves the Society of the Cincinnati. Cincinnati is a plural of Cincinnati. 
people thought it looked like the beginnings of hereditary and nobility, so it either disappeared or went underground. Who knows? It may still be out there. They're not soliciting new members because you'd have to be a lineal male descendant of a Revolutionary War officer. Okay, um, the next guy up, John Locke, who lived in the mid to late 1600s. And um, the, the, the work of his that most literate Americans were familiar with was two treatises on government published, I believe, in the 1690s. England had just fired a king. That's unprecedented. And Locke supplies some rationale. What what would make it okay? What would make it legal to get rid of an anointed king? Not get rid of him entirely like, like his father, but uh, they were familiar with that. Uh, Locke picked up on an idea that an earlier <coughs> English philosopher named Thomas Hobbes had thrown down. The notion of a social contract. Now, in Hobbes' view, uh, hypothetically, we start in a state of nature. No government, total anarchy, life is nasty, British, and short. It's the worst possible existence. So people would then, for their own security, they would covenant among themselves and agree to give all power to, a, to an authority figure. By the way, the title of Hobbes' book was The Leviathan, a mythical sea creature, the largest living being, a metaphor for an all-powerful monarch. Now, Hobbes is a monarchist. <laughs> He's not particularly handy if you're trying to set up a state like ours, but the idea that the government authority flows from the governed, who uh, in, in Hobbes's view, you put up with it, it doesn't matter how brutal the tyrant may be. Even that is going to be better than the anarchy of the state of nature. Well, uh, Locke picks that up and softens it by including a right of revolution that there's at least an implied contract between brewer and people, we bought into this very deeply, where the king has this power in, in exchange for, we, we, the people render him um, uh, allegiance and obedience and all that in exchange for protection. His job is to do justice. When an English monarch is crowned, they, they swear the coronation oath where they're swearing to do justice. And uh, it's a short step from there to what happens if the monarch breaks that contract by not providing security. You could arguably make a case, as some of our revolutionary leaders did, that that absolves them from having to obey that monarch anymore. Am I making sense here? Okay. Um, another thing you don't hear about much. Published originally in the early 1720s by two men who happened to have been John Trenchard and Thomas Gordon. Uh, they, they wrote some essays published in newspapers, quite a few of them known collectively as Cato's Letters. You, uh, uh, this guy is your identity, because sometimes you get in serious trouble for this kind of stuff. Cato was an ancient Roman in the first century BC, he was a very vocal critic of the <coughs> corruption, personal enemy of Julius Caesar. He became, becomes the hero of these men who are criticizing the rampant corruption in the British government at that time. So that's the one book that the largest number of Americans, illiterate Americans, had in their libraries. Everybody read Cato's letters. And the word Cato is still out there. It has sort of symbolical significance of people who oppose uh, government overreach and government corruption. Corruption means rottenness. That happens when members of the government are, are misusing power. Okay, so when did things start to go off the tracks? Have you ever heard of the French and Indian War? Okay. It started in western Pennsylvania. It ended up being the most significant war of the entire 18th century. It was fought in America, it was fought in the Caribbean, it was fought in Europe, it was fought in India, fought on the oceans of the world over a large area than any previous war. And after a rocky start, our side, the British Empire, won big. France, which had claimed the entire area drained by the Mississippi River system, had to give up all of that. Britain kept the part east of the Mississippi River and just gave Spain the rest. Uh, and we're overjoyed. Our side won. We won big. Uh, the French threat is removed. Now it looks like it'd be safe to move west of the Appalachian Mountains. It all just looks wonderful. Sort of a high point. Ironically, Shall we use the words, the seeds of destruction? Britain came out of this war with an enormous national debt. They doubled their national debt. 
Uh, they're led by a leader who understood that wars aren't cheap. You're going to win a war, you're going to spend oceans of money. So they they uh, doubled the national debt and drastically increased the tax rate. And here they are. They come out of this war having alienated everybody, including potential allies of Europe. And they're, they're under a huge debt burden. Plus, they've got a vastly expanded empire to try to keep track of. So uh, they got to have money the American portion of the empire is costing them five times as much for administration and defense as before, even with the French gone. So uh, the next few years, what from their standpoint, they're looking for ways to extract significant amounts of tax revenue from the American colonists. The only taxes we had prior to that were import taxes meant to regulate trade inside the empire. Uh, so they're, they're coming after us for that. Our response is that, of course, as you've heard, they have no right to do this. The Parliament cannot do this because we're not represented in Parliament. That leads to this whole uh, discussion that goes back and forth across the ocean. So uh, they're looking for ways to significantly raise taxes to pay for the war. Okay, so you have that. They begin to tighten up control of the American force of the empire. Indeed, salutary neglect, its day was done. That wasn't going to work anymore because you have these colonies, their mature economies and so forth, their internal conflicts, pitting colony against colony, uh, some internal conflicts. That happens. Who's the judge? Who's going to throw the penalty flag? If Britain's just sitting over there letting us run by ourselves, we're going to have to have some kind of authority that can uh, make a ruling step. So that's, that's what comes out of this. One of the things uh, that they did. They're trying to crack down on smuggling. And uh, let me see here. I'm not quite ready for that. I'll get to that in just a second. Uh, we resist the taxation. And British leaders look at that, that. That's one thing and one thing only. We are challenging parliamentary supremacy. Either the parliament is supreme in the empire or it isn't. And if they even listen to us, that's like a sign of weakness. So they're completely deaf to all of our uh, protests and all of that. It just, it just goes by them. Meanwhile, they respond to our resistance by cracking down harder and harder. Uh, so that's basically how we get into this. There were uh, people in, this, in the colonies who, who believed that the British government aimed to reduce us to, here's, here's the buzzwords, change in slavery. They're going to take over, take, over, take away our right to govern ourselves and set our own taxes. The entering wedge is if there's, if there's just one law that we have to obey that comes from a legislature in which we're not represented, then, then we've lost. If there's one tax we have to pay where we're not represented and whoever set it up, it's over. So we're not, we're not on the same page at all. Plus, British society is hierarchical, it's stratified, and they're here, and we're obviously here, they thought, well, they'll tell us what to do. We'll do it. Uh, and they find out, well, not so much. We want to look at some individuals, and I see the clock is already crowding me. Individuals who played major roles getting this started. I should point out the revolution is not spontaneous. It didn't uh, it's happen by itself. We don't have two and a half million colonists who all figure out unguided that the British government seems to be pursuing an incremental course that will... Uh, take away our freedom. Uh, they're, they're guided in that. Arguably, the revolution was brought about from behind the scenes by political activists who saw the saw the goal early, and although they couldn't talk about independence out loud, they used the news media to, to move us in that direction. Okay. Colonial public opinion, as this uh, firms up, uh, basically three ways. A lot of people, I guess for want of a better term, they'd be conservatives. They're already being called Tories. That's the name of the Royalist Political Party in England. And these people, and this may be any of these or, or amalgam of them, they still have this deep emotional attachment. Maybe more to the point, they think the threat is overrated. What could they do to us? They can pass their laws. We're 3,000 miles away. What are they going to do? They, they thought the threat, the threat of Britain actually ruling us is less than the threat of the whole social structure coming unglued and whatever protest might arise. So they, they clung to their uh, uh, loyalty to the king and to the empire. Okay? 
plus. We got all these advantages we would lose, uh, and th that outweighs any inconvenience that might come. They're fond of saying better one tyrant 3,000 miles away than 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 a thousand than 3,000 tyrants one mile away. Okay, you've got moderates. These are very frustrated people. They deeply yearn to stay in the empire, but what's happening is unacceptable. It's unacceptable. We've got to cut a deal somehow. We've got to get them to moderate, uh, get out of our faces, and the hope for that just keeps declining and declining. And then you have, uh, I don't know what word to use, radicals, activists, very small number of people who seem to have um, seen independence as really the only way out far long, long before that became acceptable to uh, public opinion. Okay. Individuals, now getting closer to the uh, point here, there's a, a very fiery, brilliant, unpredictable Boston lawyer you may not have heard of. His name was James Otis. Okay. Um, it can be argued that he's the one that sort of put the ball in play in the whole uh, independence movement. Uh, he's a man that is hard to pin down his opinions. He looks like he's all over the map. You never know which James Otis you're going to get. But <clears throat> the problem that, that led him to uh, make the statements he did involved the use of a type of search warrant known as a writ of assistance. It's a general search warrant. If you're a royal agent and you have a writ of assistance, it's a document with your name on it, you have the king's own authority to search anywhere any time for anything at your own discretion. Nobody can resist it. The problem is meant to solve is that the British are trying to collect taxes on molasses brought in from the West Indies. And um, hello. We go. Good. One bogey down. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> But all right, we get the train back on the tracks here. They could only search the holds of ships. When they dropped anchor in the harbor, well, smuggling is rampant. You bring your molasses in as some hidden cove where there's no tax collectors. You can just truck it down the main street of Boston and stick it in your warehouse at 2 in the afternoon. The tax collectors couldn't search there because they didn't have the authority. So they started using the writ of assistance in 1759, and it had to be approved by the high court in a colony. This was under the reign of the old king, George II. He finally died in 1760 after apologizing for taking so long. <laughs> 22-year-old grandson became King George III. That'd be a good age to be king, wouldn't it? Works for me. <laughs> okay, Did the people that age tend to know pretty much everything. Yeah. Yeah. But the thing in Massachusetts is now they got to reauthorize the writs of assistance. So this got a lot of attention, and on a day in February 1761, the highest court in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts convened to decide whether to authorize the use of the writs. Uh, the courtroom is packed, a pretty select group there, and um, a lawyer named Jeremiah Gridley was acting for the king, and he got up and gave the, the usual uh, stuff about how, yes, this causes some uneasiness and all that, but the government has got to be able to raise revenue. He's a lawyer. Lawyers don't always uh, speak from their own viewpoints. He sits down and another lawyer gets up and makes a pretty good case that probably would have worked. So far, so good. And then James Otis stood up. And a historian named, I think, uh, Jack Rakov uh, said, at that moment, something changed in America. And uh, it's Sitting there listening was a 26-year-old lawyer trying to get a practice started. His name was John Adams. He's going to live many more years. And Adams remembered everything. He wrote down what he didn't remember and what he didn't remember. Here's, here's Adams' recollection from decades later. <laughs> Otis was a flame of fire. <laughs> With the promptitude of classical allusions, a depth of research, a rapid summary of historical events and dates, a profusion of legal authorities. So Adams believed that Otis was one of the major players in the coming of independence. Adams also said, I have been young and now I'm old. And I solemnly say I've never known a man whose love of country was more ardent or sincere, never one who suffered so much 
and everyone whose service for any ten years of his life were so important and essential to the cause of his country as those of Mr. Otis from 1760 to 1770. Another quote from Adams. Sometimes this gets to me. The child independence was then and there born. Every man of an immense crowded audience appeared to me to go away as I did, ready to take arms against the writs of assistance. Okay. Did he win? Hard to say. The judges retired to consider. They've been caught up in this too. One of them said that he had read in the London magazine that in England writs were being used for more specific purposes that that you had to show evidence to a judge and just limit it to one thing, but nobody else had heard of that and they couldn't agree, so they decided they would send over to England for further instructions and delay the decision until the following year. Meanwhile, Otis was getting standing ovation <coughs> where he goes, and so here was Adam sitting over there taking notes as fast as he could. So uh, this might be worth a minute or two. So uh, what was Otis saying? He cited Cook on the non-validity of laws that contradict the traditional rights of Englishmen. And this is a quote from... Uh, A.J. Langeth, but Otis soared beyond that argument. Every man lived in a state of nature, he said. Every man was his own sovereign. Sounds like anarchy to me. Subject to laws engraved on his heart and revealed to him by his maker. No other creature on earth could legitimately challenge a man's right to his life, his liberty, and his property. That principle, that unalterable law, took precedence even over the survival of the state. Well, yeah, I guess it would. But Otis issued a guarded warning to the new king. The writs of assistance represented the sort of destructive and arbitrary use of power that had cost one king his life and another his throne. Otis worked in an unequivocal demand for the abolition of slavery. Well, he's at no holds barred. Okay, Otis, uh, that's his contribution. Um, he lost his mind for a few years. We don't know why. He suffered a blow to, him, blow to the head somewhere along the way. Some think that might have been it, but uh, sadly, he went insane and uh, suffered a very strange death. He was struck by lightning. Mm -hmm. 1903, that'll do it. Okay. <laughs> uh, next man I will present to you, Samuel Adams. He lived from 1722 to 1803. Flat failure in business. The only thing he's good at is uh, basically being a kind of rabble rouser. Uh, I don't know whether he was a religious man, but he had every 100% 100, 100 of the moralism of his Puritan ancestors. Uh, he learned early the dangers of, a, of an overpower, overpowering government. His father lost a bunch of money in some kind of scheme called a land bank. Um, he seems himself to have been completely disinterested, either, either having or making money. He's known as the uh, leader of a kind of underground conspiracy to pursue independence, way ahead of public opinion, organizing the so-called Sons of Liberty. Uh, so Samuel Adams, and he was pretty radical in his views. I don't have time to bark on this. John Dickinson, Pennsylvania lawyer. He would be called a moderate. He's neither for independence. He's also very much against what the government is doing, known primarily as the author of a series of essays known collectively as Letters from a Farmer in Pennsylvania. That's how he disguises his identity. These things were published all over the colonies in the late 1760s. It became popular to refer to him simply as the farmer. He raised awareness all across the colonies, awareness of uh, the, the dangers presented by the moves the British government was making. Um, he opposed independence at the, con at the Continental Congress. He couldn't keep it from happening, but he left Congress. He stayed on the team, he stayed loyal and all that. He just thought it was premature by, by the time it happened. It's not whether, it's just when he thought it was too soon. He's the author of the original version of the Articles of Confederation. He was burdened, I don't have time to tell you this, but I want to anyway. He <laughs> had this huge reputation that he, he was afraid that he, it that he was more than he could live up to. It was a burden to him. And uh, when he opposed independence, this was politically suicidal. He'd lost his reputation, and apparently it was a relief to him. Uh, I'm going to quote this because it's colorful. He wrote to a friend, quote, No youthful lover ever stripped off his clothes to step into bed to his blooming beautiful bride with more delight than I have cast off my popularity. <laughs> 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 okay. 
John Adams, second cousin of uh, Samuel Adams, lived from 1735 to 1826. Uh, basically from a family of farmers, he, uh, uh, he was a lawyer, a politician. He was the most uh, tireless advocate of independence, kind of made a nuisance of himself. He understood that, but historians credit him more than any other individual to getting this done. All right. What's happening here? The mid-1760s and late-1760s, we have a flurry of actions by the British government that stir protest and resistance. Primarily, 1765, something called the Stamp Act. Um, I don't have time to go into that, but it, was, it, it brought about resistance, I would say, unanimous, almost as unanimous as the, as the response to the bombing of Pearl Harbor or 9-11. Uh, even people who were later Tories, the only disagreement was whether we still need to pay it or not. Everybody seemed to be against it. They have no authority to do this, so it touched off quite a, quite a debate. And they, they uh, repealed it after less than a year. It was repealed. We won. <laughs> but to save face, and this one's probably bigger, the Parliament enacted a little uh, short declaration called the Declaratory Act, just to kind of clear the air, early 1766. Parliament basically is saying that we have no rights that it is bound to respect. Operative language, Parliament has the authority to bind the colonies in all cases whatsoever. This is fantasy. This is the same day they admitted they couldn't collect a small tax. <laughs> but if you want to know what they're thinking, here it is, friends and neighbors. <laughs> what do you make of that? So gradually, people are coming out of their apathy, and that's our number. That's our number. <laughs> Next word: Americans are notoriously apathetic. Okay. Then you have uh, other issues: the Boston Massacre in 1770. Then things calm down for about three years. Not much going on. If you're Sam Adams, you're thinking fire's about to go out. We're going to have to do something to get this going again. Then, of course, these British leaders, uh, they they might have gone to a seminar on how to alienate their own colonies. The Tea Act, 1773, there was already a tax on tea. They're, they're looking for a way to bail out the East India Company, which is on hard financial times. So they gave it a monopoly on tea sales in America. I've got to skip past that. That gets the protests going again. And one of the components of that was an incident in Boston in December 73, where some uh, disguised patriots tossed about 10,000 pounds sterling worth of tea into the harbor. That's a biggie. So the British government, in response to public demand, uh, cracked down hard, much harder than ever before. They call them the coercive acts, and here in America they're the intolerable acts. They uh, closed down the, the port of Boston to all shipping, inflicting instant, instant depression until the tea was paid for. They changed the government charter, giving most power to the governor. They uh, set up a law where any British official or soldier uh, accused of a significant crime would only be tried in England itself before a symp sympathetic judge and jury and no prosecution witnesses. So they'd have to go over there at their own expense. This is license to kill. So <clears throat> it didn't amount to that because British authority crumbled fairly quickly after that. Well, it was response to these intolerable acts that really get things going. Uh, why don't we get delegates from all the colonies together and maybe pull their brains and get something, figure out something. That led to the first Continental Congress, which met in Philadelphia in the September and October of 1774. Uh, Georgia wasn't represented, mostly frustrated moderates. Uh, by this time, they've rejected Parliament's claim on any authority to legislate for us. The only remaining link is the king. We have the same king. Parliament is part of the government of England. It is not part of the government of us. They're pretty well agreed on that. They decided to have a comprehensive boycott enforced by the Continental Association, capital C, capital A. They're going to cooperate in enforcing a comprehensive boycott of all British kids. This is the first time they worked together. You could say Continental Association, now known as the United States of America. It's just a little bit of a stretch. Okay. Um, a British general became governor of Massachusetts, General Thomas Gage, with about a 4,000-man army. Um, and what's happening here is the moderates are clinging to the bare hope that the king will come to his senses and send 
negotiators over where we can come to a deal. The king actually sent a few negotiators, but they were not authorized to recognize or deal with Congress. Only individual colonies. Well, that stay home. So the king himself seems to be doing everything possible to alienate us because they see a challenge to their authority. That's all they see. They have, they're not paying any attention to us. And the war broke out in April of 1775. So we get the Second Continental Congress, starts in May of that year, and um, the king has declared the colonies in revolt, uh, cut off all trade with the colonies, made our ships fair game for the British fleet. Really? <laughs> you want to make a deal with him? So the moderates, they, that, they just dissolve, and, and uh, that from that point on, the question is not whether we'll declare independence, it's just when. Some people thought we should wait until we have assurances of support from France. Others said, you can forget about support from France unless we declare independence, which was true. They're not going to burn their fingers involving themselves in a family spat within the British Empire. So uh, uh, Congress is waiting only for public opinion to come around. And one particular man recently arrived from England, helped that quite a bit. His name was Thomas Paine. Pretty much failed at everything he tried except writing stuff. He publishes a pamphlet in January 1776 called Common Sense. And it appealed to basically the working man's level. It's not some fancy lawyer's treatise or anything like that. And this remains to this day proportionately the number one bestseller in our whole history. Within a few months, 100,000 copies were out there in a population of less than 3 million. A book that gets that proportion, proportional sales today, millions and millions and millions, it has a blockbuster effect. Um, and there's a lot of buzz about it, showing that it's a new idea to a lot of people, and they're excited about it. He refutes the idea that our rights are best protected by the Constitution. Obviously, what they've been doing to us takes care of that. Uh, he lambasted the whole idea of monarchy. Just trash trounce and introduced it. And this, this was hard on a lot of people. It was offensive. To others, this is the slap in the face that brings them to their senses. Kings were nothing but royal brutes. He says, of more value in the sight of God is one honest man than all the crowned ruffians who ever lived. We don't call them ruffians anymore. Today we use the word thug. <laughs> Sub that one in. So that and other things, let me see. It's too important to just go through completely. Uh, reconciliation is no longer possible. It's a fallacious dream. He alleges there's an active conspiracy on the part of British leaders to enslave us, quote unquote. It's no longer in our interest. This was the main thing. No longer in our interest. We can no longer subordinate our interests to those of the mother country. We're grown up now. It's time for us to move out. He would have used that little metaphor had he been writing today. So this sells independence. Uh, and finally, an appeal to the future. How important is this? Quote from Payne, we have it in our power to begin the world over again. <laughs> A situation similar to the present hath not happened since the days of Noah until now. Okay. So uh, he's not saying anything people hadn't already heard. He just had a gift for making it, making it hit hard. Now, what are we waiting on after that? That makes independence a thinkable thought. Two more things got to happen. Has to be perceived as morally legitimate. You got to be able to excuse that, and that's not too hard. The crown has obviously forfeited our allegiance. Not only is it not protecting us, they've made our ships subject to seizure. They've cut off trade. The king is reportedly assembling an enormous army to send against us, including German mercenaries. Okay, the, obviously it's, it's morally legitimate. Finally, is it strategically necessary? That's also an easy one. We're going to have to have foreign aid, primarily France, and until we declare independence, that, that is not going to happen. Okay, so things begin to move, and we start to see declarations of independence. The Declaration of Independence was just one. There were approximately 90 declarations of independence, colonies, municipalities, trade associations, political organizations, something like 90 of them over a space of about three months. Uh, North Carolina actually formally seceded from the empire. South Carolina went first in authorizing its delegates in the Continental Congress to vote for independence, and that was a bit of an obstacle. These delegates represented 
whoever sent them, and they had instructions they could not exceed. Keep that in mind. So there's a, there's a move toward authorizing them to do that. But anyway, the, the tide is rolling. On May 20th, John Adams wrote to some guy named James Warren, every post and every day rolls in upon us independence like a torrent. Okay. May 1776, Virginia's Provincial Congress directs its delegation to propose a resolution declaring independence. Pursuant to that, June 7th, 1776, Richard Henry Lee of Virginia, a strong advocate of independence, offered a resolution resolved that these United Colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent states, that they are absolved from all allegiance to the British Crown, and that all political connection between them and the state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved. Come on, come on, Richard, tell us what you really think. Uh, if Congress passes that, they will be declaring independence. They debated it for about four days. The middle colonies aren't quite ready yet, so they tabled it. They will take it up again on July 1st. In the interim, they set up some committees, uh, one to draft treaties for, with Britain and France, one to set up a set of ground rules under which they would cooperate. Because when they say independent, they just don't mean independent from Britain. They mean independent from each other. Uh, and they set up one to draft an explanation of why this momentous thing is happening. And they've got Benjamin Franklin, they've got John Adams, Robert Livingston, uh, Roger Sherman from Connecticut, and Thomas Jefferson. Okay, you've been on the committee. In that case, you know this. Committees don't do things. People do things. The function of a committee is to determine which committee member gets to do the heavy lifting. <laughs> so Jefferson took it on reluctantly, and uh, he gets through with it, shows it to Adams and Franklin. They make some minor markups. It's submitted to the Congress on June 28th. On July 1st, they took the uh, resolution off the table and um, uh, had really quite a dramatic session. It lasted a long time. Uh, See, they're working under committee rules, so they could vote on something, but there'd still be a final vote to follow. John Dickinson, who had opposed this, he makes his last stand, arguing primarily that although we probably have to declare independence, it's just not time yet. He's not winning anybody over. And then John Adams got up and made the speech of his life. Now, he's a lawyer. He's not an orator or anything like that. Um, but it's a very dramatic setting. It went on for a bit more than an hour. Uh, it had been very hot, weather breaks, and you got a thunderstorm, lightning, thunder, rain, clashing the windows, and here's John Adams. And Jefferson said he was neither, uh, it was not great oratory, it was just so forceful, there's something, something about it, that as Jefferson put it, he transported us out of our seats. <laughs> and uh, just as he's about to sit down, three late, three new delegates come walking in and sit down, and they said, uh, could you go back over what we missed? <laughs> <laughs> so he gave a synopsis till they said, okay, we got it. Other speakers followed. The thing lasted nine hours. Then they voted. Nine colonies voted in favor. That's a majority. It's a two-thirds majority, but it's not enough. Two colonies voted against. Pennsylvania, still under the sway of John Dickinson, voted four to three against. South Carolina, rather surprisingly, voted against. Delaware had three delegates, and only two of them were there, and they split, so they couldn't vote. And uh, New York's delegates had not received instructions permitting them to do this, and that would take a while because New York's government was fleeing from the British Army. <laughs> so, well, okay, we'll postpone that. Final vote till tomorrow. Very tense atmosphere that night. What's going to happen? They get in there the next morning. By the way, the missing Delaware delegate was a man named Caesar Rodney. They sent a rider off to find him and try to get him back in time. So the next morning, just as they're about to close the door and start the session, <laughs> in walks Caesar, Rod Caesar Rodney. Uh, booted and spurred, mud spattered. He had ridden 80 miles through the night. Wow. Got there just in time. At least as significantly, two Pennsylvania delegates were not there. They couldn't stop it, but they're going to get out of the way. Dickinson's not there. His buddy Robert Morris is not there either. So Pennsylvania votes three to two in favor. Delaware comes along. South Carolina swung in the line, so 12-4, and New York abstaining. Wow. They passed the thing. They've declared independence, and that, in the minds of those men, that was the big day. That was the big day. Uh, John Adams, 
wrote home to his uh, wife, Abigail. Let me see if I can find this. Where did I put that? I may not have it after all. But anyway, that, uh, that that day would be the great national holiday. It would be the day of deliverance. It would be observed with acts of devotion to Almighty God. It would be celebrated with all kinds of pomp and parade and shows and sports and illuminations. That's where you light every single candle. From this day forward until forevermore. So, but that's not the day. The next day they took up Jefferson's proposed document, sliced and diced it, made it about 80 changes, most of them minor improvements. Jefferson's sitting over there silently, never spoke really. It's like they're cutting his fingers off, but he gored in silence. The two main things that are regrettable uh, well, one is really regrettable. He had a very strong statement accusing the king of Im imposing the slave trade on us and depriving Africans of their freedom. Cut that out to please South Carolina and Georgia. There was one that went a little bit rough on the English people. They cut that one out. They pretty much smoothed it up. And uh, they voted <coughs> again and passed it again 12 to, 12 to 1 abstention. Later, they went back and changed it retroactively to unanimous. So that document is the Declaration of Independence. And I may push the clock a tiny bit. What does it say? Uh, let's see. In Congress, the unanimous declaration of the 13 United States of America, July 4th, 1776. The United States. United is not capitalized. States is. Obviously, where's the emphasis there? They're thinking of 13 countries. We hold these truths. No, we back up. When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect of the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes that impel them to the separation. So what did not happen was they come in there and John Adams says, stands up and says, I know what, let's declare independence. And John Dixon stands up and says, dude, are you high? <laughs> now, uh, then we get the philosophical case, and I'm not going to be able to do everything with this. Uh, I'll go through it, unpack it a little bit. We hold these truths to be self-evident, so obviously you don't need them, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted, instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and ordering its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Okay, all men are created equal. More controversy over that than anything. Did it just mean men and not women? Did it just mean white men? The way the word men was used, mankind, that meant the human race, basically. So I don't think it's profitable to try to slice and dice that. I think the key word is equal. He is rejecting the hierarchical stratified social structure you found in Europe. Every man is equal in the sight of God, should be equal under government. Um, we get our rights from God. That's not a theological statement. That's part of this legal case. It's necessary to place the origin of our rights far above and beyond and out of the reach of any human authority. That's the idea there. Uh, endowed by their creator with certain inalienable, inalienable rights, easy for you to say, that among these are life, liberty, and at that point, everybody who read it did a double take. Because the philosophers have been going on for 100 years about life, liberty, and property. Same three words, same word. You got your peaches and cream, you got your bread and butter, life, liberty, and property. Property goes out, pursuit of happiness comes in. Best theory I've heard, this is supposed to improve the morale of soldiers in the field. If they had property, they wouldn't, wouldn't be out there, or they're going to put their life on the line to save somebody else's property. Put that aside, pursuit of happiness. Happiness meant just having a satisfactory situation. Uh, then he turns the radical knob up. To secure these rights, our, gov our governments are instituted among men. God gave us the rights. We set up governments for the purpose of protecting them. And here's, uh, he's going to turn an ancient concept directly upside down, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Kings invariably claim that their power came to them from God. They're upwardly answerable, not downwardly answerable. This reverses that. Uh, it's not a new idea. None of it was new. And then he gets even more ready. 
that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it. He's claiming the right of revolution. And I've got to land the plane ahead of schedule, well, on schedule, <laughs> didn't get as far as I meant to get. Let's see, um, prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for life and transient causes. And according, all experience has shown that mankind are more inclined to suffer while evils are, su evils are sufferable than to right themselves by altering the forms to which they are accustomed. But when a long train of abuses and usurpations pursuing invariably the same object evinces the design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and provide new guards for their future security. For me personally, boys and girls, that might as well have been written yesterday. Okay, then he moves to apply this to our situation. Long list of uh, charges against the king, uh, like 18 of them, and some of them were burning issues, some of them had kind of been filed off, some of them were the delegates, what? What do you mean by that? Uh, and then uh, the uh, closing of it, I'm not sure I got here, there we go. Uh, at the end, he claims that we have all this. He quotes Lee's resolution. And for the support of this declaration, with the firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. They signed it over the next few weeks. It's like nearly a month where they got it all signed. But this, as a blockbuster impact, it clarifies everything. People have something they can hang their hat on, use as a basis for deciding whether they're in or not. Uh, the people in Britain could understand it, people in France could understand it, and future generations could understand it, and we should all understand it. John Adams lived in 1826. His, his view on this whole thing, the whole revolution, he said the revolution was not just the war, the revolution was in the hearts and minds of the people. I'm going to have to quit. <laughs> Any questions? Well, that's good. Oh, all right. <laughs>